What's up, Discovery Church Online? Thanks for tuning in. If you have any questions or want to learn more about who we are as a church, then find us online at ilovediscovery.church or you can download our app free from wherever you download apps from. Today we start our brand new series, As Long As We Both Shall Live. relationship series whether you're married you're single this is going to apply to every single person here we'll be able to speak to everyone whatever life stage you're at um but february is usually our relationship focus here at discovery around here so we have like our marriage our first annual unity marriage conference coming up this saturday we had our small group start they launched last week um, we're getting into this series. So February is a relationship focus, and every single one of us here can improve in the area of our relationships. Anyone agree with that? Like, you can improve in your relationships and be better at relationships. Let me start off this way. Let me start off this way. A little participation from our audience here. You guys play along with me, okay? Um, it, how many ladies here dreamed about, no, hold on until I get all the way done. How many dreamed about your wedding day or getting married? Maybe possibly even your dress. Uh, you, you dreamed about your husband, what he would look like. Maybe you dreamed about him carrying you over the threshold into your perfect home. Like what your even perfect home look like. Some of you, you named your kids before you ever met your husband. Uh, any of that? Ladies, lift your hand. Any of that? Any of that? Don't be lying in church now. Come on now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, men, men in, in, in the room, how many of you did any of that? Okay, thank you. So that's what I'm saying. So we, we, have these, all, we have these different expectations of marriage. How about this? Men, uh, how many of you, you dreamed, when you dreamed about, you know, getting married, you dreamed about having sex twice a day and three times on Sunday. Come on now. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There we go. That's just the, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to have fun with this series, you guys. It's going to be a lot of fun. But we have these different expectations and what happens when we enter into marriage and relationship and some of these expectations go unmet? I mean, we're very different people, men and women, okay, species. And, and so when they don't go unmet, there's pain and hurt and disappointment, right? Some of us have experienced this. There's, there's um, wounds. There's even divorces because of unmet expectations. That's kind of what happens. Now, one more question for you guys here today. How many are still dreaming for your marriage? You want still have hopes and dreams for your marriage? Come on, everybody, lift up your hand. Lift up your hand. Everybody here, I hope that you're dreaming for your marriage and your relationship still. And I hope to inspire that in this series because there's that question of, and it's the question of this series that maybe you've asked yourself, and I'll put it up here on the screen. Um, it's not in your notes, but the question is of this series, are great marriages possible? Like, are they possible? Are great marriages possible? Like, is it possible to have a great marriage? And I want to answer that beyond a shadow of a doubt emphatically. Yes, absolutely it is. But I also want to be real honest with you today and throughout this series and just tell you, it's not likely that you will have a great marriage. It's just not likely if you do marriage the way everyone else does it. Okay, here's the theme verse of today. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 7 says love never gives up never loses faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance now everybody look up here you guys that right there is that that's a picture of god's love for you i want you to know god loves you 
so much. He will, his love is ne- will never give up. He'll never give up on you. He'll never write you off. You'll never be a lost cause to God. Even when you give up on yourself, you don't believe in yourself. God is always hopeful for you. He has plans of a hope and a future for you. He'll never give up. But wait a second, Pastor Jason, that's God. That's God's love. Is it possible for me, for you, to actually love another human being like this? Like like a never give up kind of love, a never lose faith kind of love, an always hopeful, endure through every circumstance kind of love, and as long as we both shall live kind of love? And the answer is yes. God has a plan for your relationships. He has a plan for your marriage. He does. And, and some of us think that this kind of stuff right here, this, this 1 Corinthians 13 stuff, is only true in fairy tales. It's only true in, in movies. And like some of you think, you think like, man, if everyone was honest, if you were even honest, Pastor Jason, you'd say like, like marriage is tough and you're just enduring it and, and trying to, you know, uh, get by with it, which I'm not, yes, marriage is, is a struggle at times to become one. That's it. That's it. To, to get along with humans is in, in and of itself, but then live with them 24-7. I get you. I get you. I get it. But I disagree with it being just a fairy tale. God has a plan and a purpose for your marriage. But I do want to say very honestly to you that it's just not probable for you to have a great marriage. Actually, in fact, the odds are stacked against you. You have a 50-50 chance just statistically speaking here, a 50-50 shot of making this thing work. Now, there's really no other area in life that you would take that odds. No other area. But in marriage, we just kind of accept it. It's just, oh, just 50-50. That's the way kind of, that's the way it is. It's a 50-50 thing. And we all kind of just accept that, but there is really no other area in life that you take those odds. For instance, like if you're on an airplane and the pilot gets on, just, is there a pilot captain speaking on just want to let you guys know you have, there's a 50% chance we're going to crash today. There's a 50% chance we're going to make it to our destination and uh, hope you have a great flight. And, right? But no, you're getting off that plane, correct? Right? But we're supposed to somehow just accept this as, as like the way there is, like there is no other way, but there, there is. There is another way. God has a plan for your marriage, but in order to increase your odds and for you to have a great marriage, uh, and as long as we both shall live kind of marriage, you got to commit to five things. I'm calling them the five keys of a as long as we both shall live kind of marriage, a forever healthy marriage. This is biblical principles. These five things will change the odds in your favor. It'll, it'll, it'll change the odds. Here they are. I'm going to give you the whole series right here. I never do this, but I'm going to give you these five keys right now, the whole series every week. Here they are. Write them down. Number one, if you're taking notes, seek God. Seek God. That's today's topic. I'm going to show you how really this is the number one essential to relationships to seek God. That statistics change drastically when you have this one component active in your life, not just in name only I'm a Christian, but we seek God, that changes the statistic. Next week, week number two, we're going to talk about committing, the second commitment, to fight fair. Fight fair. So what we're saying is we can't keep you from fighting, okay? You get two human beings together, there's going to be fights. It's just going to happen. But, but this is what I am saying. It doesn't have to be destructive to your family and your heart and your emotions and your marriage and your kids. It doesn't have to be destructive. In fact, it can be very constructive to your marriage if you knew how to fight fair. And, and believe it or not, God's word has a lot to say about conflict and, and how to fight fair. We're going to talk about that in week number two. Week number three, write it down. We're going to commit to have fun man we're gonna have fun marriage is supposed to be fun man and i just want to give you a disclaimer on this one this one right here this is the romance message okay just just give you a little disclaimer all right we're talking about having fun part of having fun in marriage is we're gonna get a little romantic all right so if you have kids that are under the age of 13 you may want to send them to discovery kids that week all right and i'm seeing the guys like wide-eyed right now what date is that pastor i'm coming to that one that's week three 
right? No, seriously, hey, dude, I'm in your corner that day. I am, I am on your side that day. You don't want to miss week number three. Have fun, okay? Here's number four. We're going to commit to stay pure. Stay pure. There is no way your marriage, your relationship is going to work, is going to last if you're going to fall into the same trap, the same vile, disgusting lifestyle that the world says is normal, the world says is okay. You're going to go down with the rest of them. We got to commit to staying pure. Here's number five. Never give up. Never. These are the five commitments. We're going to talk about what endurance looks like in that week number five and how we can actually live out the as long as we both shall live part of the vows. Now, you guys are more probably more familiar with the more traditional vows. I changed it some years ago. You guys are more familiar with till death do us part, right? That's till death do us part. And I changed it because... I, I, w- I asked this lady, and I always do in pre-marriage counseling whenever, I don't do it as much. We have a lot, some different pastors that help us out in this area. But when I was doing a lot of it, um, I, I would ask the couples, hey, um, do you know what this means? Till death do us part. Like, do you want me to add anything else in the vows while we're at it? Is there anything else that you will, you will part for? Let's go ahead and just put it in there. I mean, we say these vows, and, but do we really mean it? What else? Let's go ahead and put it in. Is, is, what, is, if he cheats on you, if he yells at you, if he kicks the dog, I mean, what, what do you want to put in there? Let's just put it in there. Let's get it right. So I'm telling this lady, like, do you understand what this means? Till death to his part. She says, yes, absolutely, Pastor. I get it. It means I can't divorce him, but I can't kill him. And I said, <laughs> hey, that's not, that's not what we're, so, okay, that's not what it means. Uh, we're going to explain what it looks like in week number five, so hold off on murdering your spouse until... I explain what it actually means, okay? So this is it. I rarely do this, but I want you to know where we're going. I really believe that God wants to do an amazing, drastic transformation in marriages and in relationships. And for you single people, God wants to do something amazing and drastic in your life to prepare for your future. So I wanted to give it to you. I want you to know where we're going. Let's say it all out loud. Let's all do this. Let's say it all out. I want you to, we're going to commit to number one, we're going to do it again because that was terrible. No, nah, we're going to commit to number one. Jesus. All right. Then after that, we are going to commit to. And then we're going to especially, man, we got to have some of this in our marriage. We're going to commit to number three. And then we need to number four. Jesus. And ultimately, at the end of it all, we need to commit to. Never give yes, that's it. These are the five keys. I'm telling you, it, it's 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 the game changer. It's the odds changer. It'll change your statistics um, if you include these five keys. Now, I'm going to start with number one today. Seek God. To seek God. How do we do this in our marriage? And really, this, this, um, this key, this commitment, this, it's a fundamental commitment. It needs to become part of your life. And really, I think that maybe it's, it's not a part of your life as much as you probably think this is a part of your life once we kind of study it together today. It comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Jesus says this, but seek what? Seek first his kingdom. Seek first. Now, what does that mean? What does he mean, his his kingdom? Let me just paraphrase it for you. Seek first all things God. Go after all things God as a priority in your life. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, in my life, I'm going to go after all things God as a priority. And when I do, check it out. God gets involved. So there's even some Christians that God is not actively involved in their life because why? They haven't made room for him. You say, Jason, how do I get God's power involved in my life situations? Seek first his kingdom. And look what happens. All these things will be given to you as well. Listen, Jesus is is saying, if you focus on getting close to me, I'll take care of your stuff. But if you try to take care of your own stuff, what you're basically doing is opting out of my power working in your life. That's what's happening. Now, as that relates to relationships, a lot of people make the mistake here. And especially, you hear it from single people. I hear it from single people a lot. They, They say, Pastor, pray for me. I'm, 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 I'm looking for my one. I know there's one out there for me. There's that one, and I'm looking for my one. I'm seeking the one. I pray, pray for me. They even say things. You can tell they watch too many movies. They say, I'm looking for the one that will complete me. I need to be complete because I'm incomplete right now. 
I'm incomplete. And if I get another person, I, then together we be complete. I need to be completed, Pastor. <laughs> Which is really, it is really a flawed and dangerous concept to live by. It really is because no one can complete you. No one can complete you, honestly. And even you married people, a lot of you entered your marriage and relationship that way, um, idolizing your spouse. And so you said, wow, this person's terrific, is amazing, is incredible, and probably she is. He might be. But you prioritize them before God. You put them in the, in, in the, in the wrong place. And this is so important because, listen, anything you idolize, you eventually will demonize. All right, let me say it again. Anything you idolize instead of God, you will eventually demonize. You know why? Because they're not fit to be an idol. They can't live up to that expectation. No matter, no matter what, you idolize whatever other than God. You idolize your sports team, okay? Eventually, that team is going to let you down, all right? They're going to lose it. They're going to mess up. They're going to let you down, and you will be calling for the head of the head coach, right? Why? Because you idolized it, then you demonized it. Like some of you, you said, oh, man, when I met him, Oh, when I met him years ago, he was, he's so laid back, he's so calm and collected and never, never flustered. Man, I just, I'm so friendly. And, and, and then 10 years later, he's just a bump on a log. Where's she spontaneous anymore? Where's the adventure? What happened? Same dude, idolized, demonized. Okay, some of you said, oh man, she, 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 she's, she's so organized and detailed, and precise. I, lo I love that about her. And 10 years later, she's a control freak. Pastor, you don't know what I'm dealing with. What happened? Same girl, idolized, demonized. I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over and over again. You got to understand, we can't allow people to take the position in our life that only God was intended to fill. And truth be known, you guys, a lot of reasons why we have a lot of failed relationships is because we're expecting from people what can only come from God. It can only come from God. When we seek first his kingdom, really, they can't live up to the pressure. Your spouse, your relationships, those people can't live up to the pressure. It's too hard. And the reason, the, the reason why we're even expecting them to do that we're expecting it from them is because you really don't have it in your God. Because it only comes when it's in first place. And you, whenever you put something else first, it, it does not give you the same return that God guarantees. Here's the principle of the message. Write it down. The principle of the message here. God is my one and my spouse is my two. God is is my one. I'm going to seek God. I'm going to go after God. And you say, well, what does that really mean? Well, let me apply this first principle. First, let me, to those who are not married yet, in fact, play along. Everybody, everyone, let's play along here. If you are not married here today, you are not married. Everyone play along. If you're not married, but someday kind of hope to be, go ahead and lift up your hand. Leave it up. Lift it up. Come on. If you, come on, everybody. Now look around. Look around. Look around. Look around. There they are. There they are. There's your, there's your candidates. There you go. I just helped you out, man. Okay? All I'm saying, all I'm saying is if it works out, just name your middle child of your first, the middle name of your first child, Jason. That's what I'm saying. Because I helped you out, man. But some of you, some of you are seeking that person. You're looking for the one. And I want to speak to those who aren't married yet. I want you to make this commitment. This, write this down in your notes today. If you are single, make this your commitment. I will seek the one while preparing for my two. I will seek the one while preparing for my two. I heard Andy Stanley give an uh, tell a story that illustrates this point really well. He said there was this teenager. She was in high school. She was a Christian and, and, and a, you know, a committed Christian, go to church all the time. Her family would as well with her. And, but she graduated high school, went off to college like many kids do. She, she gave in to peer pressure and started partying. It started with partying, then it started drinking, then she started doing drugs. And then she just, it just went from guy to guy to guy to guy to guy. And she was in this, she started living just this destructive lifestyle that was 
that was sinful and destructive. And, um, but she had in the back of her mind that, you know, I'm still a believer. I still believe in God. And she even dreamed that one day she would be married and, and her ideal man was a godly man. I have a God, I want a godly man. Someone who, and had these different qualities. And, and she said, so someday I'm gonna, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it. And then as her life went on, she eventually met that guy that fit every requirement. I mean, oh, he's a perfect guy. Godly man is a disciple of men. He's a great leader. He has a great career, kind and gentle, just a great man. She went and told her mom, mom, I found someone who's perfect. And she began to explain the qualities. He's this, he's that, he's godly. He's, he's just a great guy. And mom, I'm gonna start making myself available to him. Will you pray for me? And her, her mom said to her very kindly, she said, sweetheart, I'm glad you found something that meets your expectations. But I, I want to let you know, sweetheart, a guy like that is not looking for a girl like you. Yeah, can, and that's okay. I wanted you to go, ooh, mm, and just hit right there a little bit. That, was, that point was supposed to be like a, oh, kind of point right there because it's supposed to kick the gut. A guy like that is not looking for a girl like you. See, it doesn't matter what you want. Like attracts like. And my great advice for you if you're single, if you hope to have a godly marriage one day, is to start living a godly life today. Live for God today. Seek God today. Become, become the kind of person you'd like to marry. Become the type of person that you'd like to marry. If you want to marry someone who's had 18 different partners, then go after it like everybody else. Sleep around, do all you want. Live like everybody else and stay in the 50-50 odds category. But if you want different statistics, if you want to live like nobody else, live for God today. Serve God today. Seek God today. I always tell singles, if you just focus on God and let Him add to your life, he'll prepare you for that future marriage. He will prepare you. He'll equip you for it. You marry people, if you're wondering, well, how does this apply to me? It's totally different, completely different principle. If you're married, write this down. I will seek the one with my two. I will seek the one with my two. Now, this is such a big deal because even a lot of Christian couples, other than going to church together occasionally, really don't seek God together. And I'm going to show you how in just a moment. But I'm, I want to say very plainly, if you're a married couple, you call yourself a Christian, and, a, and you just occasionally go to church, but you're not really active in your faith, you did not move yourself from the 50-50 pile. You're not. That's, that, it, 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 did, it did nothing for your odds. Now, it's not only important to seek God at number one and not let your spouse take that number one spot, which I think we're putting way too much pressure on our spouses in that place because they were never intended to be that space. But for some, there's even a different application for this point, and that is for some of you, you're seeking God. He's your one, um, but your spouse isn't your two. For some of you, your kids are your two. For some of you, your hobby is your two. Your career is your two. In other words, you're putting more time and energy and money into other things rather than the priority person in your life after God is her. It's him. That's the priority person. That's, that's the person who should be, was always intended to be your two. Well, today I'm, I'm going to help you, whether you're single or married, how to seek God together so whether you're single and you're just trying to grow in god or you're married and you want to seek the one with your two together there are three principles found in god's word that listen are you ready for this that the harvard business school said works i always love that i always love when the world catches up to the bible I always love when science and, 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 and some new discovery or something like that just catches up and they go, oh yeah, I was right. I just, I love it. So, so God's word has always been true in these areas that if we apply these three areas of our life, it'll change the odds, it'll change the statistics. But they, they actually did a study and they said, oh yeah, that's right. If you do these three things, the results change dramatically. Actually, I put the statistic in there. The Harvard study revealed that, look at this, one out of 1,246 couples got a divorce if they just did three 
simple things on a regular basis. That changes. I want you to just let that soak in just for a moment. I mean, if anyone were to come to you and there were, you were at 50-50 odds and they said, I can change your investment odds to 50-50 to 1,246. I can better those odds. You, you take that deal. If you were on that plane and you just heard the pilot give you the, give you the 50-50 odds and I came and I said, hey, check it out. I got another plane over here. And, 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 and it, I, got, I, I can give you one out of 1,246 odds we're going to get to your destination. Wouldn't you do everything you could to get off that plane and get into that other plane? Wouldn't you? Well, that's not, I, 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 there is, God's word is true. And instead of, I'm trying today to get you off that plane that has a 50-50 odds, 50% of you are get, you're headed for destruction, you're headed for divorce, you're headed for pain and trauma in your family, and I'm just saying, there's a better way. I got another plane, it's called the word of God, do you want on it? It works. It works. I want to increase your odds today, church, that as long as we both shall live, if we do three things, as, and these three things I'm going to give you, they are, a little, they are a little challenging. They may even be, make you a little bit uncomfortable, some of them, maybe. But they work. They work. Here they are. Write them down. That as long as we both shall live, we're going to do these three things. Number one, this is what, and I love this. Harvard said this was true. And you know what, they, you know what it is? A couple that prays together. Pray together. Come on, pray together. I mean, you've heard that euphemism. That is a true You've, it is proven a fact that a couple that prays together will stay together. Now, I know that prayer is one of those Christian disciplines that everyone knows we're supposed to do, but it's hard to do, especially like in public or with other. There's this uncomfort. There's this awkwardness when I do it in front of people, when I speak in front of other people, my, my, my prayers. And so we even come to this belief, this false belief that my faith is private. It's just between me and, and, and God, which, by the way, the devil would wants you to believe that he's okay with your faith being private it's castrated it is this is this is this is a this is a lower form of your faith was never meant to be private it was always meant to be public your faith was always supposed to be demonstrated and expressed in an each other experience in one another experience look at james chapter 5 verse 16 he says therefore confess your sins and by the way, the sins here aren't just your mistakes. What, is, what this means here, it means every area where you have a problem. Every area. So let's read it that way. Let's read it that way. Confess your problems to not just God, to each other. You need to find some people in your life that know what you're praying for, what's on your prayer list. What are those issues and problems that you're talking to God about? And pray for each other. Now, I intentionally highlighted both of those each other's because if you want prayer to work, God is an each other kind of God. He's not just a you and him kind of God. He's an each other kind of God. And your faith needs to take on an each other kind of expression for it to really work. And that kind of prayer, that kind of righteous prayer, he says, that works. People get healed. Like it works well, he says. Well, that's what we want. I mean, what does that look like, though? Part of my job as your pastor is not just to come up here and be like, okay, so pray together. Go, go do that. Go pray together. But I want to, because uh, when I even say that, the guys in this room, I know you're all like, oh, dang. And then the ladies are like, yay, yay, amen. Let's preach it, pastor. I get it. I get it. I get it. It's awkward. It's a little bit uncomfortable. I, 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 let me kind of help you out here. What I'm not saying is that you need to wake up in the morning together with your spouse and go into your prayer place and, and, and pray together in your prayer time. That's not what I'm saying. No, I know that some couples do that. More power to you. Veronica and I don't even do that, if that makes you feel better. We do not spend our, our individual prayer time together. It just We have just never made that be. Sometimes, obviously, we, we do pray together at times, but it's not a one of our consistent routine devotion. We don't include that. What I am saying is bring prayer into your marriage. Just bring it in. So, like even between service, Veronica's praying for me. She'll she'll come and lay a hand on me, and or, or sometimes I get a headache between services because I yell too much, and so she'll massage my head and just and start to pray for me, healing, and and God speak through him, and she'll give me the essential oil, M grain, whatever it is, and I rub that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. 
So, or Veronica had an important meeting this last week. I shot her a text and said, honey, I know you're going to that important meeting. I'm praying for you. Just want you to know I'm praying for you. Just bring prayer into it. Just try it. Um, just, just try it. Just see if it, if it works. Start it. Try it. Even at the dinner p- table, you do it. You, most of you do it. You pray, you, you pray for your meal like your daddy taught you or your mama taught you, your grandma or whoever. Why not just include a little bit more at the end of that? Why not just, start, just you know, after you pray for your meal, just say, God, bless my kids. That they'll live for you a godly life, God. Give them good friends. And God, bless our home. Protect our home. God, bless our marriage. Be a good example to our children, God. And resurrect this meatloaf to something tasty in Jesus' name. (laughs) Amen. Like, whatever. Whatever it is, just, I'm saying, just include prayer into find your comfort place and then stretch yourself. Like, push push yourself just a little bit and bring prayer into your life, even if it's just a text, honey, I'm praying for you, just want you to know I'm praying for you, just bring prayer into your life, because a couple that prays together stays together. Now, I want to say something to the singles right here, okay, that I think it's, it's healthy for you to have a prayer life, and even in each other, if you're single today, it's healthy for you to have an each other kind of prayer life, but if you're dating someone, do have, have that prayer life in public, or with other people around, Okay? And for heaven's sake, don't pray with the person you're dating on a couch. Because then you start speaking in tongues, and not the tongues, holy tongues, okay? <laughs> and I'm just, I'd be fun. I'm a little funny about it, but I'm serious. I'm serious. Because prayer does something. When we engage together our spirits, we, we in, in, entreat God in the throne room of God, something spiritually happens and does something in our hearts as we agree with one another. That's why, married couples, that's why you need to do this. Because something supernatural takes place in your heart as you pray and grab, I'm serious, like if you, husbands, you want to really rile your wife up, man, get her excited. Serious, you just, just grab her hand. And just speak a prayer, uh, just a qu- eight, three, five, five seconds. God bless my wife today. Whatever she goes, whatever she's going into, God, make her a conqueror in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, man, you're going to make yourself, I don't care what you look like, you're going to be the most attractive man right there. <laughs> We're going to save more. We're saving more for week three. Week three is coming. It's coming. Okay. Second, second thing, Harvard affirmed that God has been saying all along that if you want to change your odds, as long as we both shall live, we're going to pray together. Man, if you're married, you have a lifelong prayer partner. That's who she is. That's who he is. That's my lifelong prayer partner. As long as we both shall live, we are going to pray together. Number two, as long as we both shall live, we're going to discuss the Bible together. We're going to discuss the Word of God together. Now, once again, Veronica and I don't do... Um, the Bible like reading devotion together. We do on occasions, we'll read scriptures and share together, but we do not have a combined devotional consistent routine time. Again, some couples do that. More power to you. Awesome. We've just never been able to work. I have my devotion time. Veronica has her devotion time in the word. Um, we've, We've honestly, we've tried to be a devotional family. We've tried. I went to Lifeway. It was Brian back then years ago. I went to Brian. I bought a family devotional. I'm like, we're going to be a devotional family, man. We're going we're gonna to live for God in this. We're going to raise these kids right. Man, I got that devotional. And, and invite the kids to live. Come on, we're going we're gonna to have a devotional. It's the evening before, before showers and, and bedtime. Come on. And the kids are, are you kidding me? Oh, oh, dad. Oh, dad. The devotional dad. Oh. And they're just like, I'm telling you, I, I got booed out of my living room. For my kids, we've tried twice to be a devotional family. It did not work. I'm saying if you can make it work for you, praise the Lord. But, but we've just decided that in our family, that, that devotion and Bible reading was not going to be an organized, formal thing. We've just decided to include the Bible in our everyday life. We include the Word of God in our everyday life. We do what Deuteronomy chapter 6 says. And, and I'm, just, I'm trying to give it to you so practically. You can do this. It doesn't have to look like maybe you think it looks like. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 6, these commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. How? Check it out. Look, just talk about them. Talk about them at the, at the dinner table when you're driving down the road, when you're going through life, when you're picking them up from school, when you're dropping them off. Just talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. We've just decided 
that instead of making Bible study and devotion something corporately formal in our home and even in our marriage, that we would just become, the Word of God would become part of our daily life and conversation. So I talk about it with my kids. I bring it into our discussion, the Word of God and His principles and His truth in their friendships and in their education and in their choices and in their life future and in my, with my wife. I'm t- I talk to her about my devotion and what God is burdening me with and share it with her and bounce ideas. What do you, this is what God is. What do you think, honey? And, and she's sharing stuff with me. That just, we're just bringing the Bible into our marriage. Discuss the Bible together. Discuss it. It's going to change your odds dramatically. If a couple prays together, they stay together. Discuss the Bible together. And here's the third one, and this one is, um, you, 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 you know this. We all know this. Number three, attend church together. As long as we both shall live, we're going to attend church together. And, and I know some of you are like, oh, that's great. We're here. You can move on from this one, Pastor. That's good. But I want, I, can, I, can I call you to a different level in this thing? Okay? I'm not just... I, I want to challenge you not just attend church together, but I want to challenge you to attend church together faithfully. Like faithfully attend church together. And, and in fact, I want to submit to you, I want you to consider making, and I want you to talk about this, talk about this with your spouse. It's, it's your business. You guys talk about this, but I want to challenge you that you would consider making your family, your marriage, that you say in this family, we are a we don't miss church kind of family. That's, we just, it's a priority in, 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 in our life. So what we do, I'll, I'll tell you what, even in my family, even before I was a pastor, we didn't, we didn't let the weather, you know, what, what the weather was like and if my sport team was playing or if the kids had that thing going on or, 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 or if the series was right. No, if it's the right series, this, this looks like a good series. I think I'm going to go to that one. Or, or who's, who's preaching? Who's leading worship this time? And who's, who's a, and it, the, no, like that's, that was never the, the, like, if it fits today, I, I'll just, I, I'll, I'll go. To, no, to make church a, everything else waits. And our family does church first. That I want to just kind of challenge you. Now, I've never said this to you before in our four years, you guys. Honestly, I don't need to fill more seats. I really don't. In fact, we're sending people. <laughs> we're like, go do downtown, and we're going to send 50, 100 people to Northwest. We're trying to make room, so please hear my heart. I'm not trying to fill seats i love you i am your pastor i love you i am your friend i'm trying to change your odds that i'm trying to change your odds and if you will seek god first and what that looks like is praying together discussing the word of god together and making church instead of an occasional casual thing to make it a we don't miss kind of thing like make it a commitment some of you hope that your kids one day would be god loving church goers but can i tell you something stay at home parents don't raise go to church kids you're wanting to produce something in your children that you're not willing to, to, to reflect and sow into. Watch this, Luke 4, 16. Jesus says, he went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue. Look, as was his custom. He didn't say, I think I'll go to church today. It's a good day. No, it's time, it's time for church. I go to church. That's what, that, it was my, it's his custom to, I am, a, I am going to, if you're wondering why this got stirred up in me, let me give you the backstory, okay? I've never told you to do this, but I think it's important. I think it will change odds in your marriage and family, in your life, if you made this kind of commitment. It was about a month ago, I was out in the community, got stopped by a lady. She said, Pastor Jason, oh, your word on Sunday, it was so, blessed me, thank you so much, such a good word. And I said, oh, thank you so much, man, God, glad it blessed you. She, she said, yeah, I, mean, I thank you. I am so glad we decided to go last Sunday. And, I, and, and that stuck with me. I, I mean, I ended the conversation, I left, but that just, it just stuck with me. And it just like, it was haunting me. We just, dis- I'm glad we decided to go last Sunday. And I just thought like, why would anyone leave that to chance? What, you mean you didn't pre-decide as a priority in your life that you were going to meet with God? That you were going to gather with God's people? That you were going to worship corporately, receive His word, get that revelation? You mean you don't pre-decide that? Why would anyone not pre-decide to meet? I just, I don't get it. I don't. And we're, we're playing like 50-50 odds. That's what we're, we're doing. We're like, oh, if the weather is good, if this is good, and, and, and man, if you want your marriage to be like nobody else, you got to live like nobody else. 
You got to change the odds. We have to. Listen to me, you guys. I'm telling you, look, what would happen if, if we did? If we made this a priority, if we made like church a priority in your schedule, I'm going to tell you, it would change your odds. Check out this last verse, Psalm 127 and 1. It says, unless the Lord, you see, unless, unless God gets involved in your marriage, unless God gets involved in your relationship and in your home and in your kids, and you can go to all the counseling you want, you can read all the books you want, you're laboring in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. Now listen to me, you guys. You've got to get God involved in your marriage. Neither, neither one of you are good enough to make, the, to make this thing last as long as we both shall live. Are you ready for this? Neither one of you are good looking enough to make this thing last, okay? Because all that, listen, because all of it fades. All of it, all of it fades. We got to have something stronger and greater at work inside of us because we are fallen. So what are we going to do? Well, as long as we both shall live, we're going to live a different way. What does that look like? Write this down. Let me sum up this message today. The number one essential of a healthy relationship is living a God-first life. And that, my friends, changes everything I'm telling you today. You live that God-first life. It will change the odds. Come on, let's go to God in prayer. Every, every head bow and eye closed right now. <laughs>